This is Karen with Nuclear Room, and it is time for Heart Mojo with Belinda Smith. And for those of you watching, you may notice that there are some discoloration in this video. Apologize for that. And uh, sound quality may not be exactly the same when I, as when I record at home. Um, I happen to be in Fort Worth, Texas, and I am sitting in my son's closet recording today's show with Melinda. And Melinda, you were nice enough to suggest, yeah, well, Karen, maybe you don't want to do it today. You've been uh, nursing a, an ill son. But I said, oh, I need the hour to get away. So here we are. And yeah. uh, we have two doctors with us. So do you want to do a little intro and have them tell us who they are? Well, so I read your bio, honestly. I think you two should talk about you because I could never do justice for all the things you two have accomplished. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks. Um, boy, let's see. I'll, I'll start. Tim and I, uh, May and Tim Hindmarsh, um, we're a dual physician couple. We've been married just about as long as we've been doctors. We've been We've been married three days longer than <laughs> you got it wrong. No, wrong. We were doctors. <laughs> we're doctors three days longer. Three days. So you waited until you finished, right? And then you got married. We graduated on a Thursday, got married on that Sunday. Well, there you go. And then oh, went to our residency. And we are both actually uh, Canadian, born and raised, and did our medical school and residency training in Canada, and then immigrated to the beautiful us of a for all the freedoms that it offered and the american dream even uh, canadians some canadians wanting to escape so we've been practicing medicine in the u.s and the pacific northwest since 1994 and uh, we were small town country docs did everything from patient practice icu coroner tim did a full obstetrics practice and raised our kids. Um, we've gone from small town, small medicine that's gradually built up over the years into big corporate medicine, which we uh, left. I've worked in medium sized organizations, worked through COVID in COVID clinics, which actually was a real, for me, and I think for Tim as well, um, kind of our, our um, Normandy moment that really re actually revitalized this believe it or not, in some ways, as opposed to most healthcare workers, because we felt like we were stepping up to the plate and really helping people through a horrible time in a, you know, in our, our lifetime. Um, and now we've come full circle. Um, we're podcasting since COVID and uh, Tim's helping a startup clinic locally in an independent practice for empty nesters. And um, we've had lots of adventures over the years. Uh, from missions to crazy sports to a thriving marriage and all the things in between there that's it in a nutshell the now you see one. why i said i could not remember all of that <laughs> and i wouldn't put it in the way that you do which is very meaningful to be able to tell people what you've gone through so some uh, exciting things it sounds like yeah i have to ask though most u.s citizens think it's better to go to canada for medicine, right? To be up there for their medical uh, procedures. You came here. Can you talk a little bit about what made you come to the United States versus staying in Canada? Canadian healthcare system is perfect if you want to stand in line until you die, which literally happened to May's mother. She stood in line until she died. And oh then I'll just say that. So, first off, I'll let Tim. Uh, Usually it's you know, I'll just kind of I'll pull the pin out of the talk, grenade and, and go. we'll just, just go ahead and go for it. We <laughs> yeah. like it. I'm going to do a global thing briefly and then he can get into the nitty gritty because he's better at that. But times have changed from when we left Canada. So now, obviously, that was 94 to now. Um, the healthcare system in Canada is pretty much the same. It's socialized one payer system, which is the government. That means they have all the money. They control what happens with your tax dollars, which pays for healthcare and they make the decisions and they control the physicians and the healthcare organizations. Medicine, when we moved to the US in 94, as you know, has changed a lot in the US. So 
um, while things might have certain aspects of healthcare look more rosy to us back then because we were in a smaller system and had more independence. Yes, things have changed now. Some not for the good. Some are still much better. And so I'll just say that the U.S. system is not perfect either. It has a lot of flaws in an opposite direction. Costs are crazy. But um, we'll explain why you know, we well, chose this system over Canadian. And, yeah, no, and, and, and people think that the Canadian system is the American system, but with access and coverage for all. And it's, and it's not. It's not. That, that, that's the key. The, there is some very, very specific advantages of the system in Canada. There's no question. If you're young and reasonably healthy and you need your appendix taken out, it's perfect. You don't have to worry about health insurance. You show up. You're, you're going to get your emergency surgery. It's not an issue. If you want anything elective done, forget it. I mean, it takes forever. So if you want a knee replacement, it's two or three years on the waiting list. Wow. And so they, they have the waiting list because, I mean, you, you can say what you want about why it's a waiting list, but the reason you make people wait for procedures is so they die on the list. There's no question that that's the case. It's so, called rationing. They have so a certain ration, amount of money but, and they have to decide how they're going to spend it. But the fact and, is, is that healthcare has to be rationed. It, it's a limited resource. Mm -hmm. it just, like, nobody can ever have all of the healthcare they absolutely want. It, that's impossible because to get healthcare, you need to have highly trained people. You have to have physicians and specialist physicians and surgeons and physical therapists and nurses. And all of these people have tremendous input costs and a tremendous time cost so that they can take care of you. So you're going to ration healthcare no matter what. Okay, if you had a 100% free market system, which we don't even close to that in the United States, we have a crony capitalist system where gigantic corporations join with the government and make the rules. So in some respects, we have the worst system you could, you could uh, invent because it's so unbelievably corruptible. And we've seen that like crazy in the last three years. Oh, for sure. Where, you know, so, you know, who writes, who writes the Affordable Care Act? Well, the insurance companies wrote the Affordable Care Act. People don't understand that. Insurance companies and pharma wrote that. So then it becomes the Unaffordable Care Act. And, and there's, you know, there, there's some nuance in this, but there's some big picture items in here that, that I think it's really important for your listeners to understand. The Canadian system could be absolutely amazing if they did one thing, which is allow people to buy private insurance, which they don't. So Canada is not like other countries that have a, a bigger safety net so, uh, from a socialized government system. It's not like the National Health Service in England where you can opt out mm -hmm. or, or you can still have NIH coverage, but you can pay outside the system. You can have your own insurance. That would get rid of a lot of the waiting lists in Canada. I think that it would increase the quality because you know physicians and hospital systems would be competing for those dollars, which are good things. They're innovation drivers, but it doesn't happen. The Canadian Health Act, when it was passed in, I think, the early 70s, made it illegal to bill outside of the system. So as a physician, I can't just say, I'll see you, but I'm just pay me cash. That's against mm -hmm. the law. It's changing very slowly in some provinces. But if Canada actually had a two-tiered system like that, it would be great because it's, it's a very resource-rich country that has you know, a stable economy, you know, again, and a very small population. So and why won't they consider it? Like, why won't they consider adding in private insurance or the ability to pay? Um, it's happening in the province of Alberta, and it's slowly kind of metastasizing, but it really is. It's, it's a, it's a commitment to this kind of social ethic of it has to be the same for everyone or else it's not fair. It's a very cultural based, I think, decision in fair across the board is kind of a theme that goes, uh, you'll you'll see it i mean with healthcare um but other things as well as it, it's it's fair as if it's fair it's got to be fair and equal for all so but it's really not fair and equal for all no. you know nothing else in our lives is i mean i was going to say like, why should that be the food we eat but the houses you know in, the cars we drive the education schooling yeah yeah well i know last summer my husband was diagnosed with prostate cancer and it was very minimal. Um, and his doctor said, you're very lucky to be living in the US because 
we can do treatment. If you lived in Canada with your score numbers, they would tell you to go home and wait till they got worse. And we just looked at them and we said, but why isn't this less expensive for Take us and now. the government to do it now? And he said, yes, but be glad that you're here because in Canada, you'd be sent home to die. That's well, correct. And, and that's and kind of what happened. We see that happen with patients, family, friends, same thing with the prostate cancer, leukemias, my mother, uh, that was just insane, her story, but she had surgery uh, right, but right at Christmas time and was diagnosed with metastatic uh, abdominal, a rare abdominal cancer, a carcinoid that was more aggressive really than we knew, but she was sent home and they said, well, we'll call you when there's an appointment or room to see the oncologist. And there was only three in the province at that time. And the, the waiting list was such that you just had to wait. So, and so, we, so I, I answered the phone call from the cancer clinic. Sorry to interrupt, no, but, but I want to put a point on this. So she had surgery in December for a di the diagnosis of this cancer. She got, a, I answered the phone. The cancer clinic had an appointment for her on April 1st. So wow. almost five months later, unfortunately, she died on March 31st. So it was when they said, is, is Barbara there? I said, no, I'm sorry. She passed away yesterday. Thanks for your help. Click. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you remember, Karen, I had breast cancer. So when I felt that I had a problem, I didn't have any health coverage. So I went to my OBGYN, who I've known for years, and I said, I think I have a problem. And he said, okay, well, we can get you in. And I said, problem is I don't have insurance right now. And he said, oh. And I said, what if I just pay you cash? Nope, I can't do that. Our local hospital, one of the biggest around, and you could probably guess because I'm in Cleveland, said, no, you couldn't see me. So he said, come back in January when you have insurance because I had to buy it on the open market. So it took another three months to get in to get the mammogram to find out that I had stage two B breast cancer and it had gone to the lymph glands. Now, had they saw me in October, maybe, and it was a rash. And see, I worked in plastic uh, surgery and I had a lot of breast cancer patients. So I knew that the rash was an odd, you know, thing right. that, to see. So you go to an emergency room and they're going to go, you have a rash and they're going to give me a cortisone cream and send me home. That's what they would do. So it, that's a system where we have insurance, but when you don't have insurance, you don't necessarily get the care you need quick enough here for sure. Well, yeah, but it's, it's not, I, I totally agree, and, but it's not insurance. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, if it's truly insurance, then you would pay based on your, your behaviors, just like you pay automobile insurance based on your driving record. And, and it wouldn't be very expensive. It would be very competitive unless you were mm -hmm. a obese smoker with high blood pressure and a heroin habit or something. Um, and then, you know, obviously that would be more money because your chances of getting sick. Right. But, you know, the best solution I've heard to this problem is a hybridization of, of expensive inpatient medicine and surgeries and outpatient, you know, what we do, primary care. So the best solution I heard to this is, you know, you want incentives aligned to keep people healthy and to motivate behaviors and to increase access. So if you made the primary care side essentially just cash, it would become very inexpensive. And I, I would argue access would explode because you would be paying way less money. Like we could see patients, we, we could see patients for a copay, honestly, if you did it mm -hmm. right. And, and you're paying that anyways. So why ship your money off to massive multinational corporations for them to redistribute it as they will? Like, tell me how that's going to make things cheaper. It's not. Right. It right? doesn't. So then if you had... If you had the the hospital side more, uh, those physicians more salaried, maybe that side is more dependent on government oversight. I don't know. So because you don't want to go to a, a spine surgeon or a breast cancer surgeon that gets paid to do more surgeries, 
You want to go to a breast cancer surgeon that does the right surgeries. Right. Right. You know, and, and it, I mean, they, they, I mean, they've tracked this, you know, you get paid more money to do a C-section and then they wonder why C-section rates go. Right. Up. Well, I mean, and, and I was lucky because I knew enough about surgery and breast cancer and things like that, that I could be an advocate for myself. Most people can't because they don't know enough. Right. So I shopped and I made sure I had the right surgeon and I was in control of my care and what I did. And I chose to do some treatments and I chose not to do others, even though they wanted to do it all. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars it was. Yep. And I said, nope, I'm not going to do this. I don't feel that the percentage of increase of my life expectancy was going to be beneficial, right? 3%, not big change to go and do uh, radiation on top of chemotherapy. So I chose not to do it. But not everybody, they'll just do it all. And you're right. They tell them, yeah, we do every bit of this. It's crazy. And I feel bad. I watched people like a deer with the headlights, right? They don't know what to do. They're just following blindly along. If they have insurance, they get everything. And if yeah. they don't have insurance, like my cousin who had breast cancer about the same time, they did minimal. They did a little lumpectomy. Me, they did, you know, mastectomy and lymph glands and all sorts of things that they did not offer her at all because she was on Medicaid and young on Medicaid. If you're Medicare, Medicaid and over 65, they'll, again, they'll do everything for you. But for her being 50 some years old at the time, she did not get the same care. It's, it's sad. I was going to say the, the other thing that came to my mind is, you know, this is the United States. So every state is independent, but I think in True. this, you know, without trying to make it socialized medicine, there's got to be a way to break down the the lines between the states so that people can shop across markets in an open access system. So pick like the state that we're in, you can go and shop for individual health care plans very easily. Our, you know, in another state where our daughter's in, it's not so easy if you want to just shop for open access. And so I, to me, that just doesn't make sense that whatever state you're living in, you're really limited by what that state offers. Why not open it up across the entire U.S. Well, to the and, open markets as far as if you're why shopping not, for individual health care? Why not be able to buy what you want? Right. Right. So if you don't want brain aneurysm insurance and you have a brain aneurysm, well, you didn't make that financial decision. That one's on you. And because, you know, why should a retired why should a retired nun be paying for someone's birth control? I mean, it has no effect on her. And this is where you get into all the, I mean, it, it, these are very complicated, hard to answer questions, mm -hmm. right? Like if I, if I live my life absolutely perfectly and I don't drink and I don't smoke and I exercise vigorously and I, I have an impeccable diet and I never am one ounce overweight. Why should I be paying for my neighbor who smokes three packs a day and has lung cancer? I mean, th those are the those are the questions because right. we've reached a point in healthcare where most of what we're treating that's really expensive, especially most of what we're treating that's really expensive that we do in my business because I do primary care mm -hmm. is is behavioral medicine. Right. You know, well, I will say that I was not the poster child for breast cancer. I was a fitness coach, never smoked a day in my life, moderate alcohol usage, never did drugs, wasn't overweight, really took good care of myself. And there I was with breast cancer. So I probably would have thought at you know, that point in my life, hey, I don't need that. Right. I don't need that extra insurance. But it ultimately I did need it. So I guess you never quite know. I mean, you can only do the best you can do. Right. There, I mean, can't the cancer, the big C word that, I mean, there are lifestyle things that impact it, but you're right. It, I mean, it, yeah, but it, there, it can spray, spray gun anyone. I mean, We're talking look, I mean, the biggest spenders, diabetes, right? hypertension medications. Um, Usually diet and cholesterol medication. Um, a lot of the antidepressants, uh, GI things. I mean, those are all based pretty much lifestyle and man, those are the, some of the most expensive. And then the medications they give cause other problems, which they need an additional medication for to fix. 
Of course. I love do. watching the things on TV. It amazes me. Yeah. Well, there's an ad that, that we mocked in one of our shows. And it, and it's it's the bent carrot medication. I, the 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 name of the medication ex- escapes me now, but I looked it up, and I actually read the patient information. This is not the information that is going to physicians and urologists that are injecting needles into your penis because you have a twenty degree bend. Okay, that's what it's for. All right. Mm-hmm. One of the side effects is you might hear a popping and crunching sound (laughs) followed by a massive hematoma that renders you impotent. And I was like, okay, who in their right mind would actually take this for a problem that's- There better be a lot of upside if you know what I mean. (laughs) Really? (laughs) And and there's not. And there's not. There would be no upside. Studies and you see the difference in this curvature, it's it's minimal. Right. But but not only is there a market for it, there's a market that's big enough to sell a wildly expensive medication and advertise millions and millions of dollars during college football games, like absolute prime time. And you're like, this is just beyond. I mean, I looked at it. Just and then laughed. you looked up actually the data on how much it actually improved oh, it's, uh, male it's, sexual performance. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't make the, any, it. It, does, it was like three percent. I mean, like no, it's, that's just in. That's a. It's a cosmetic problem. It's right. A problem for some men, but it's it's largely a cosmetic. And I'm like, like this, like we have a lot. Like if space aliens came down from space and saw this, they'd be like, oh, forget it. Like we're, we're <laughs> out of here. Like this is completely insane and then there's the whole I mean, we've done shows on direct to consumer marketing <sighs> how much money pharma spends on marketing i mean it is the biggest advertising budget on television television now oh, absolutely everything is sponsored pretty much by uh the big corporations starting with the letter p every you time you turn around there's a commercial for a new drug the ones for depression i swear to god you know it causes depression and suicidal tendencies. Why are you on it? Or the um, the one Cindy Lauper's on, isn't it for psoriasis or something like that? She's on every commercial because there must only be four people that have, you know, psoriasis <laughs> in the world, and they're on every commercial. And that can cause other problems. Is it really that bad? Well, <laughs> I, mean, I think that, I'd live with the psoriasis. That's no, the, thing the, is, the what's new one. The, the, the new one is eczema. Okay, yeah. so so. Like if you right. have enough psoriasis, I can understand why you could potentially take a immunomodulating yeah. modulating agent. Okay. But if if eczema, you are taking an immune modulating agent, which they admit on the ad may increase your risk for infections, may increase your risk for bizarre infections like tuberculosis, right. and may give you lymphoma or leukemia. These are extreme and, cases, and you sit there, severe cases. It's like Okay, I've done this for 31 years and I'm sitting there going, you know, I just haven't seen that much eczema in adults that you would go, oh, I just, I, there's nothing I can do to treat this. It's <laughs> like, like what happened? But, but I guarantee you, people are going in and they're getting this. Oh, sure. Otherwise they wouldn't be spending the money on the advertising. Just like using diabetes, uh, diabetes medications for weight loss now. Right. Yes, exactly. But I will tell you, there is a diabetes medicine that, and I don't have diabetes, but uh, I was having breathing problems and they put me through everything, couldn't figure it out, um, tried other medications, but they put me on Jardians, which initially was supposed to be for breathing problems. They turned it into a diabetic drug. And in order for me to get that medication, my doctor has to verify so much information that I'm afraid if he ever leaves practice, you know, I'm not going to be able to breathe properly. So, I mean, the medications are crazy that are out there. And then for those of us who are on Medicare and you hit what they love to call that donut hole, which nobody can explain, you get to a point in the year, you can't afford your meds. Right. I'm, I'm frightened to reach that. Medicare. Well, but it, like, but it, it's so ridiculous because, you know, like you look at, you look at, th- th- this is just, I mean. Oh, well, let, I was going to just I'll, jump in for a second. Absolutely. So let's talk about the Medicare thing. Going back to Canadian system, just to compare, a lot of people think that, that 
that's the other thing is all the medications are paid for. They're not. They're not covered at all. They're not covered Canada. at all. They're price controlled to a certain degree, but their their stuff is still, you know, obviously really. So expensive. you're still paying for it up there. You have um, universal coverage for f- physicians across the board. Access is not just the same as here, uh, but medications no. And same people buy supplemental pa- pl- pa- uh, plans, uh, depending what province they're in. To cover it for because, meds because for medications that part's right and then the same thing for dental coverage or glasses etc so it's not like oh you just yeah i'm happy to accept paying 45 percent taxes when i get to a certain income level and above um, because then i have that peace of mind because i have bad health and my family history is bad and i know i'm going to be on all these medicines when i'm old everything's going to be covered i'm that's the that's the you know thought you're going in with and it doesn't work that way not in canada so a lot of people think that and they say well i'm happy to pay 45 percent taxes and have all that covered because it's peace of mind for me well i'm sorry to burst your bubble but no there's good you're going to be paying for it on top of that so well and you're going to be paying 14 percent sales tax yeah in virtually every province in every province so as well. on, on top of the you know, because the progressive tax system is similar to here, except it you end you get to 50 percent taxation at a much lower rate. So, so there's yes, definitely got to be a better way. Um, and I would. So, how, how do you feel about using alternative approaches? So again, local hospital has a whole department with um, um, acupressure, acupuncture, things like that. How do you feel that that fits in um, from your perspective to help? Because we were talking about more prevention, right? Just doing things, watching your diet, weight, those types of things. How do you feel about those um, treatments? I think that those treatments are things that everybody should be doing. It should be part of health in general. And that absolutely, I utilize, we utilize all kinds of uh, things, you know, me more so initially, but we do hyperbaric therapy for our aches and pains, red light therapy. Um, we're obviously big believers in fitness and diet and sleep, but I have a chiropractor I've used. I've used massage therapy forever for my migraines. Um, we have people go do acupuncture for various things, modalities, and incorporate all these different things. We've seen... Um, a naturopath for health issues because we figured that they had more to offer us than a Western medicine based practice right. for certain things. So there's, I think all of those things have a place. Um, once again, we get no coverage in healthcare for those. So even if a doctor does recommend them, which they do occasionally, right? right. Especially pain management, things like that. You can't get, it's a fortune. It Correct. is a fortune to cover those things. And I, I agree, like years ago, I would uh, work with patients who would come in and I'm like, uh, all they're going to pay for is a narcotic for their back pain. It would drive me nuts because I'd say, this isn't helping the problem and it's going to create another problem because most they're going to become addicted. And it's the easy right. way is to give them a pill where they need some PT or massage therapy for five to 10 sessions. In the long run, it's going to be putting them back to work faster, back in the workforce, costing less in the system. And you're right, it's not paid for it. And it would drive me bananas. Yeah, but you're, but um, you're making but, the assumption that it actually works. And the problem, well, the problem is, is that in that's the there, there's, there's healthcare, which I hate the name because it's not healthcare. It's a business model to extract money out of people. Some of it works really good. Like, it, like if you need a hip replacement it, the or a knee replacement or a, a cancer surgery, the United States is the place to be it's Mm -hmm. wildly expensive ridiculously overcharged for a bazillion reasons but the care is outstanding that part of the cutting edge technology stuff we've done a tremendous job of okay now the other side which is where we come from is a complete disaster and it has been entirely co-opted by gigantic insurance companies government regulation and and big pharma so they're all in bed together, pharma, the insurance companies and the government, they're all in bed. They're just, it's just one back is scratching the next in a little circle. So big pharma donates to both parties like crazy. Mm-hmm. So nothing ever changes there. And then they get 
their protections in whatever bills pass. The insurance industry is essentially writing the laws so that they're protected and they donate like crazy. And then the regulators are the ones that actually kind of, inf- they have the guns, so they enforce the, the regulations. And then people wonder why it's expensive. Well, it's expensive because there's no reason for it to not be expensive. I mean, why are iPhones way better now than when they came out in 2007? But the price really hasn't changed. It's because it's a free, it's, it's a, that's a truly free market. You don't have to have an iPhone, but right. people choose to do that. So innovation goes up and prices are controlled. I mean, flat screen TVs are ridiculous. When they first came out there, what, like 10 grand for a four yeah, inch? Now they're $300. With $300 and you get like a 95 inch TV. <laughs> Which nobody needs, but yeah. Those hairs on the guy. <laughs> and that's what the real, you know, that's, that's Uber. That's, you know, DoorDash. All of that is true free market. There is the free, again, I get real passionate about this because the problem with the American healthcare market is it's a co-opted market that's co-opted by the guys that write the rules. Right. How do you get out? I I don't know. What I've seen in Cleveland is so many of our doctors who had private practices, those private practices have been taken over by the hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had a physician for the last 25 years. Um, And two months ago, he told me, uh, he was retiring. And I looked at him and I said, but you said retirement was not a word in your vocabulary. He said, did I tell you I wanted to retire or I am retiring? He was just told by the hospital, you're going to lose your rights to the hospital. So, you know, bye-bye. And I've seen it happen so many times and that that's not how it used to be. When yeah. a doctor was in private practice, you know, he chose how late he was going to be because he wanted to spend more time with his patients. So how did the two of you do this? Because your patients are getting true care. Well, there's two ways. (laughs) Um, We have opted out of corporate medicine um, because for those exact reasons. And also because I don't want someone telling me you know, how I can do things. Now, the practice that I'm in and the primary care that I'm doing is still, we still take insurance. So, but we're our own entity. So, you know, we can kind of do what we want. You just, you know, obey the law and you have to obey the contract. Mm -hmm. There is another way, which I think is better. And it's called direct primary care. So direct primary care, you pay um, usually, I mean, it depends on your age, But, you know, usually no more than about 100 or 120 bucks a month, depending on where you are in the country. And you get you get a doctor. They are essentially on call 100 percent of the time. Like a concierge doctor. That's what it's not concierge because it's it's a fraction of the cost. Most concierge would start at five or six hundred bucks a month. Yeah, they're expensive. Very expensive. No, direct primary care is very inexpensive. And so there's a lot of. Um, I have a couple colleagues that are are doing this and what they did is they got, they have um, a lot of patients in faith-based cost share programs where they're paying maybe 500 bucks for essentially a high deductible uh, insurance for their family. And then they're paying maybe 150 a month. So they're like five, 600, six, 700 bucks a month for their whole family. But the care they get is absolutely unbelievable because these physicians don't tend to have as many patients. They can spend as much time as they want. They get to know you. You know, if you get a bladder infection and they know you get these every six months, they just call the prescription in. It's the way it used to be. Right. It's the way the family it, doctor. Exactly. It's the way it used to be because it's, it's deregulated and it's cash-based. And that's why I'm a huge believer. And if you wanted to affect, you know, if you want to get around a lot of the co-opting of the insurance companies of government regulators of the pharma industry that's what you do you just you have to go out of the system because once you're in the insurance system like i am still you know there the the, he who pays the piper calls the tune and that is still very true so what happens this is what i never that i can't understand in the healthcare system so you have a primary doctor and you go to the hospital 
you never see that doctor. You see the doctor who's on the floor that day, maybe for two days, and your specialist, and then your primary doctor, who's the person that follows you, supposedly, has no knowledge of what's going on, can't even come in the hospital to visit. I don't understand that system. So do you, are you able to go in and see your patients since you're not part of the system necessarily? Um, I would say, so we've been out of a system like that for a while, but um, you're right. I mean, we worked in a system where we took care of our own patients. And then as time, if things started to morph, they hired hospitalists to make it, it was doctors were complaining would call and taking care of people. And it's first we had, you know, on-call nurses for, for us for the, the week and the weekends. And then it was, well, let's have a doctor that just specifically takes care of the patients in the hospital, because then you won't have to round on your own patients every morning and on the weekends. And to, it was to take the burden and make lifestyle better. Um, but you're right. There was a trade-off for patients and physicians, because then you start to lose control as well as knowledge of what's going on. Uh, I think it would depend on what system you're in if you're allowed to go in there or not. I mean, I think well, you, you can, can you, go and visit as a yeah, but friend, you can, you, but not as a overseeing. Right, right, client. exactly. Correct. You but yet when they leave, the care goes back to you. Correct. Yeah. So, so the problem, you're missing a piece. Yes, but there's some there's some advantages yes. in hospitalists. And, what the, you know, the biggest advantage, I mean, there's a huge lifestyle advantage when you're a busy primary care doctor because you're not working in the hospital, which doesn't necessarily reimburse that well. And you have to keep up on a lot of this hospital stuff. That's the, that's good because it makes you a great doctor because you actually see sick people. Okay, the 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 bad is you may not be as skilled as somebody that only does hospital medicine. So there there there's a lot of rationale to say, look, we have people that all they do is hospital medicine. Now you lose the continuity, which is an issue because. You know, if I'm admitting a patient that I've taken care of for 15 years, that's a completely different experience than somebody just seeing them for the first time. Right. So there's a pro and con in, in that where there's a problem, which there's been a pro problem. This problem started as soon as there was two different doctors, which is handing things off. Mm -hmm. and, and the handing off is an issue because not everybody has the same electronic medical records. So it can be hard to transmit. That so information. true. Um, that boggles my mind. I think maybe it reflects on our age and our training or what, but uh, I don't understand why people can't pick up the phone, call the doc and just say, Hey, am I missing anything? Your patient's in here. This is what's going on. It could be just a kidney stone to a more complex, like pulmonary embolus. They're in there. Believe you me. I am that go between for my mother who's in rehab. And just, and, and just like, this, is, yeah, here's the deal. Am I missing anything? Is there anything yeah. I know that I don't, that wouldn't be in this record that I have access to that would make care of them easier? Like, do they have a mental status problem or dementia and they're not understanding? Or are they, is their baseline breathing always this terrible? Or are they, I mean, it could, it, it, all it takes is 10, 15 minutes. Well, I don't, so I don't know that either. And maybe I'm missing something and an ignorant, but I think uh, a simple call. And it's maybe one more thing to add to the list in a busy doctor's day, but would make the ultimate thing is we're there to take care of patients. Well, most of the time, the nurse practitioners make the calls anyway. I rarely ever speak directly to the doctor. And lately, I haven't even seen the doctor. I take my mother there and it's a nurse practitioner that there is seeing her. But either way, with her being in rehab, I have been that go-between. I picked a doctor in there, you know, the doctors who monitor the rehabs and nursing homes that belongs to the same system, yet they still don't talk to each other. So I had to get the records. I had to send the records, make sure that they were in hematology and took her out for that appointment because of her blood work. Nobody else did that. It's so right. it's terrible that it, she would fall between the cracks if she didn't have me and my sister following up with everything. We, we, I don't know who would be taking care of the problems that have developed. It makes me think of, I did a mission trip years ago of my first one to Mongolia. And we literally were in this scary hospital. <laughs> Somebody's family member was admitted to the hospital. Uh, the, you, you would have nothing in there other than if your family didn't take care of you, including food, pretty much every supply. And if you wanted to see the doctor, you had to take them downstairs to meet the doctor for the appointment or the doctor wouldn't see you while you were in the hospital. Wow. So family members had to take them down there. And I mean, we're, I don't think we'll get to that point. Let's knock on wood, right? But, <laughs> but it's, you're right. It's like, if you're have, 
having your family member advocate and get records and coordinate care. I mean, come on. Right. But if we didn't learn something, if we didn't learn this in the last three years, then we didn't learn very much is people, patients, regardless of it's me as the patient, patients need advocates. And, and you can, you know, if you go in with a, I mean, th- there was stories during COVID of like 10 year olds and, le- and, and younger being left alone in ERs with no parent there because of this virus that's so scary, which is just like, it makes me so seethe with anger. Like that is so unbelievably cruel and inappropriate. And, and it's, it's just, we, it really shows the point that you, you have to have an advocate. And the fact that well, the family doctor I have done used this. to be that I, and the quarterback I, well, for it. But kind of, but you still need a family it. person to be the advocate. The, the fact that I have worked in this for, for so long, and I have worked at all different levels. I've been on the parent board of a billion dollar a year multi-hospital system. I've worked at all different levels in insurance companies as far as you know, some medical oversight and quality of care, et cetera, et cetera you know, pharmacy and therapeutics, blah, blah, blah. And I can't still decipher a bill that they send me. And oh, I, I still can't necessarily navigate the system. So if, if I can't do it, how is a 82 year old frail elderly person with the beginnings of dementia going to add, going to navigate it? The answer is they're not. It's they're not. not. And the only reason that I'm able to really navigate is I work in the senior care industry. So I've worked in an assisted living independent and uh, memory. I've worked in a SNP. So I can at least navigate. I may not know everything, but I know where to find the information if I don't know it. I can see the people there who are totally on their own. I don't know. I really don't know what happens to them. And it's very sad. Somebody well, needs know, to stand up for them. And you know, it's scary because when my son got ill last week, of course, who did he call? Dr. Mom, who does not have training or a license. Um, he was in so much pain. And it wasn't his chest. I kept saying, call EMS. You don't have a choice. And he waited till the next morning to call. It was not his heart, but it was a gallbladder that was about to rupture. And they saw it in the seat in the x-ray. And I'm sorry, the ultrasound. But they said, well, we have to do a CT scan. So three, four hours later, they do a CT scan. Well, we now don't really need to confirm it in an MRI. He'd been sick from 11 o'clock the night before. It was like seven o'clock the following night. And they're saying, yes, you need emergency surgery. But you know what? We're going to do it robotically. And they went in robotically. And oh, we can't do this because guess what? Your gallbladder is three times its size. In one of those tests, they should have known what they were going in to find. Well, they do that to Bill Moore. Yeah. And I was there. I'm. I was acting as his advocate long distance. And then I finally flew down here. I said, you know, he's 32 years old. He's never been sick. You know, he can't do this on his own. Absolutely not. Absolutely. Absolutely not. I mean, and and that's, you know, I think of that and I rewind and you rewind that to like 1976 and what would have been different. They would have laid a hand on his belly and they would have gone, wow, we think it's your gallbladder. We're going in for surgery. That's what, mm-hmm. would, that's what would have happened. Exactly. You would have got a lot of morphine after the surgery was done. The surgery, the surgeon would have walked out. He would have dictated. He would have had a cup of coffee in one hand and a smoke in the other. That's what would have happened. That's true. And, and it's hundred percent true. I mean, we worked with all these guys and, you know, we had a guy that was a cardiothoracic surgeon at the hospital we trained at, and he couldn't make it through big lung cancer surgeries because he had to have a smoke <laughs> and, and people would would flick him all sorts of crap. And he was like, yeah, at least I know I'm going to die. And, but you know, great no, surgeon. <laughs> it's, it's the other, I'm just, I'm thinking the same thing happened to my father, another extreme. He, he was a highly functioning, active 82 year old and collapsed unconscious in the parking lot after leaving the dentist's office. So the ambulance takes him to the hospital and I get there within, it was a half an hour. He's still, mostly un- uh, unconscious, kind of obtunded, had been incontinent, his oxygen levels low. And so the ER doc is doing all these tests and like, well, this test is normal and this test is normal. And well, he's kind of coming around and uh, I, we can't find anything wrong. So we're going to send him home. And I'm thinking as 
the daughter as but as a doc i'm like something's not right with this picture mm-hmm. so as a hospital doctor you're not concerned at all that this highly functioning 82 year old like you said your son is a healthy 35 30 something year old is now had this life-altering event of and you're ready to send them home because the tests all look okay aren't you concerned yeah but what what were the tests and 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 i I know but the key was is that he was (laughs) desaturating when he hadn't smoked a cigarette other than behind the high school in 1946 but it took me plus talking to thankfully the nurse in charge uh that you knew that i knew and she's like, I'm going to advocate for your dad because something's not right. I'm like, well, heck yeah. It doesn't take me being a physician to even go, oh, what about this, this, and this? Um, and then he got admitted and the hospital is find out, find out, you know, he had his massive bilateral pulmonary emboli in both, you know, saddle emboli and lung fields. He, he, I mean, he should have no, been, case... been dead anyway, that's but a, he would yeah, have been dead. That's a case with, they, well... without the CT scan, he, he so, would have gone home and died or, I mean, he shouldn't have survived anyways, which is but miraculous. you're right to the his point so say if i wasn't around um who's gonna advocate for, right. for him i mean is it is, there, is he gonna be lucky that some nurse coordinator is gonna be on and just say this poor gentleman i mean well some- and they're all over i will tell you you know case managers and they're all overworked and they have so many patients and they just do what they need to do that they feel is the safest part and they move them on the mm-hmm. nurses a lot of the nurses do that as well and advocates today that are private are like two fifty an hour. Once again, it's not really affordable no. to have an advocate that you pay for. Nobody's working at a reasonable price. Yeah, we've created this system. You know, uh, well, we I'm think I'm willing we, to work for an unreasonable price. <laughs> we've created this system. We think for the better, where it's all chopped up again, and it, we've come full circle because we got recruited. The reason we came to the U.S back in 94 was because a the Canadian government was telling us where we could work because they were the ones in control of the dollars and we said no thanks but b we had a system where everything was divvied up and all specialists and people would just pick and hop between specialists right and there was no coordinator and insurance company said this isn't cool we need a quarterback you need a primary care doc so they were heavily recruiting primary care doctors to the U.S. and the whole thing was you had to have a PCP approve everything to coordinate care, and then that, and then that's totally changed. And now I think we're back. No, no, but it's it's almost. no, 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 no. The, the Hydra. What's happened in primary care, if you are in the insurance model, is the Hydra has grown another leg. Yeah, there you go. So, so, so now you used go. to see your, you know, we are country doctors. You used to go to your country doctor to do everything, right? You know, my dad graduated in 1958. He took out tonsils. He did appendectomies. He became a specialist in anesthesia and still was a primary care doctor, but there was no residency for anesthesia then. So who cares? You just, you know, use the ether, don't blow up the hospital, right? And so these people were really, really great at treating sick people, which is what I think that doctors should do. Okay. So then we get into managed care, which was in the early nineties. And it's like, we're going to try to get the quarterback, the primary care doctor to manage more of it, kind of like it was back in the day. We're not going to just have everyone just go to specialists because it's too expensive. Okay, that's reasonable. That is a reasonable thing. At least they're actually an advocate for the patient. They know the patient. They're kind of coordinating. But now what's happened is, again, we've grown another leg on the Hydra. And so now that leg is is performance monitoring, Mm -hmm. which literally comes out. It smells like sulfur because it comes from the pits of hell. So they, they come up with these quality metrics. So it's not just... We want the doctor to be your, the primary care doctor to be your advocate. We're going to tell them what they advocate for. Okay. That all grew out of the stimulus package in 2008 and the ACA. And so, so we've taken highly sk- skilled practitioners and made them box tickers. So if you could be, you could be 50 years sober. And if you haven't been seen in six months, you're going to go in and the doc, the, 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 you know, the medical assistant take in taking you or the physician is going to ask you, you know, how many drinks do you drink? I haven't drank in 50 years. So I'm recovering alcoholic. Okay. Are you safe at home? Does your wife beat you? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a priest and I've been celibate my entire life. You should know that it's in the chart, you know, and, and it's just, can't get and, beyond. and, 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 and 
right. yeah, but I don't want to answer these questions because I'm here for a hangnail and I think I have an infection in my finger. It doesn't matter. We have to do this. Well, why do you have to do it? Because that's how you get paid because right. primary care doctors get paid very well on the, on the back end. If you, if you tick enough of the boxes and some of them are reasonable, like, are you asking people about screening colonoscopy? Are you controlling people's mm -hmm. blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. But some of it is just crazy. And so we have physicians that are so lost in the weeds because they're pressured by their employers to get the metrics right because the, the employers make more money and the physicians make more money if, if you do all of these metrics. And then, but, but, you know, so everyone gets screened for depression. Well, okay. Is that good and, or bad? And who's screening them? It's the person. At the right. And then, and then you sit there and you go, the you go, well, what's going to happen if they're positive? Well, they might leave with a prescription. Well, who does that help? Right. They don't, you know, they don't leave with a counseling appointment. They leave with the person, you know? And so it's been so poisoned that even the advocates are losing their skills in just caring for people and doing what I think doctors should do. We shouldn't be in the preventive medicine business. We should be in the seeing sick people business. I think that dietitians and health coaches and uh, uh, you know, physical trainers, they should be in the preventive business because they're, because what they do, it's far more cost-effective to talk to a skilled dietitian about what I should eat or a health coach about how I should be, you know, behave than a physician. You don't need my training I mean, to trained, tell you smoking is yeah, bad. We're trained in disease management. You, you need equipment. my training to manage disease. That's it, but, but now they're making us health coaches <laughs> and, and I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. It's super expensive and super inefficient. And then people wonder why they can never get access because we're not doing our jobs anymore because we're getting paid to do a different job. And, and most patients wow. don't understand how their physician gets paid and why they're getting asked these questions. And it is 100% straight through payment Check right this to out. the insurance companies. I just had well. surgery on my arm on Friday. I'll wave that thing around in front of your camera, but uh, I'll let me tell you. So I had specialized orthopedic surgery on my elbow. And what was the first thing I go in for my appointment, I had to this new doctor, great guy. The first thing on that fill in the patient questionnaire tablet that they gave me, I kid you not. It wasn't, did you have an injury? What hand do you write with? It was, do you drink alcohol? Do you use drugs? Do you smoke? Are you depressed? And I got so frosted because <laughs> even as I know what's why this is, I'm like, I said to the receptionist, you're an orthopedic surgeon. You shouldn't care about do that. with my <laughs> elbow because he's not going to treat me. If I say, yeah, I'm an alcoholic or I smoke too much. He's not going to take care of that. It's all incentivized and paid because that's how the payment plans. Work. Well, and then they limit the time. So once the doctor actually gets in, yep. you've got 10 to 15 minutes tops. Then they start knocking on the door if you spend more time because they're going to have to charge extra if you stay past that time. Right. You and know, then, as, as family docs uh, trained in family practice, it I would, you know, I got mad in 20, 2008 and 2010 and uh, kind of left family practice then and did urgent care for that reason because I got so incensed that they were controlling things. But uh, if it's flooded over into urgent care, but my point would be what a, it, most of the time you feel the, someone fills that in on a tablet and say they are, decide I really want help today. I'm going to fill this in honestly because I'm here for help. Well, the receptionist, like, is that the person that you really want to open up and come clean to? Or is it the MA that just is there to take your blood pressure, take your vitals and, oh, are you depressed? Do you smoke too much? Uh, do, what happened? No, you you want your primary care doc to, to like be the one to say, hey, what's going on? And when you s open up and say, yeah, you know, I'm drinking like three times as much as normal. I'm mostly drunk. This has happened this week. It's a real intimate and right. moment and a door opening a moment to really do some good to that patient. And I just think it's disgusting how we just throw it on the front end to tick the it, box. It, to get it's, paid. it's interesting. Well, if they said that they were drunk that much, I'd usually say, I want to party with you, but that's, that's a different story. <laughs>
so you the, know what I mean. The, no, of course, it is. It is exceptionally. It's exceptionally intimate because you have to be very vulnerable. But it's interesting because, as as much as I think in totality, it's probably unhelpful that to do most of those surveys. Every once in a while, you get somebody that answers it honestly, and it does open a door right. to a conversation that, that is potentially helpful. So it isn't like it's all bad. And I, I, I can't even impugn the motivations of the people that came up with this. It, 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 that's not the issue. It's not that you know Obamacare or the ACA or whatever you want to call it was set up with bad motivation, okay? I mean, I mean we like to get into this politically and you know, one side's good and one side's bad. Let's just assume good intention. Preventive medicine is a good thing. That's, that's where this came from. And you know, if we can do more to prevent things, then we'll decrease costs, decrease hospitalizations, and we won't be doing expensive stuff. The problem is, is I think preventive medicine is the dumbest thing in the entire world because you don't use medicine to prevent stuff. You use medicine to treat disease. You use diet and exercise in weight loss programs, and meditation, and prayer, and good relationships to prevent things. And you can't medicalize that. That is beyond medicine. And, and, and there's hardly anything we do that's preventative that requires medical technology that does much. I mean, colonoscopies in the right patients are fantastic preventative tools. Mammograms in the right patients are reasonably good. Not as good as most people think, but they, they can definitely be helpful, no question about that, and have definitely saved lives. But this idea that you're going to take a highly skilled person that takes 10 years to train and then make them a health coach for preventative medicine seems insane to me. It's like taking my favorite impact wrench that I spent $400 for because I switched from air to electricity because I like building cars and using it as a hammer. It's a terrible hammer and you just destroyed the tool. And that's how I see what we've done to primary care. We're using an expensive specialized tool for something that we could do wildly better, like way better. I mean, we've had health coaches that we've paid for. They're way better at encouraging me to exercise properly and eat properly than any doctor I've ever met. Right. And they're a fraction of the cost, even the expensive ones. And our coach takes videos and she's at her infinity pool in Laguna Beach. So it's probably working out okay <laughs> for her. <laughs> Sit there you go. And it's totally worth it. And it's a fraction of the cost. Part of, I think, our, our dilemma is people don't think it's worth it unless it's a physician. Not everybody, obviously. I was a fitness coach and, you know, I, I did that. But I do think that the attitude of a lot of people is, well, the doctor is the one that's the expert. They can tell you what you need. They can tell you to go do exercise, not the other person because they're not a doctor. And I think that's, and we are a litigious society. So people are like, well, they gave me the wrong thing. I'm going to sue them. So they're looking for what they feel is the best expert. No, you're, that's you're right. opening up a whole nother can of worms. Right. I think because I, I, you know, by my own interests, I, you know, would know quite a few things on weight training and diet and exercise. Uh, but I'm like, I, I'm really good at suturing and setting bones and putting casts on and uh, the, you know, the fine cooking of balancing certain medications and endocrine, this and that. But uh, why that that training that and all that skill and that art I've learned in doing that. Like and now you want me to try to figure out how to tell somebody to if, if what, but, how many weights per, uh, they should right. be doing and how many reps like, or motivate people. I'm not a good motivator. I, I just like suck it up buttercup. Cause I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like you're, it, I don't, it's funny how the doctor says it. It's yeah. But if that's true, if what Melinda says is true, which I think is, largely true as far as right. that's how people think right but if you think that through logically that not only do i know what blood pressure medicine to put you on i'm going to know how to train you as a personal trainer then you should lose your license if you're a fat doctor yeah. doctors <laughs> should lose their license i agree, I agree. and and i like i said 
don't take advice from a fat doctor. Now you could take advice from a fat surgeon because they're cutting and putting stuff together. Right. But if they're giving you advice on, you know, diet and exercise and diabetes and all of this stuff, do not listen to them because they at minimum don't believe it. They're not walking their talk. Yes. They don't right. believe it. Right. Now, I mean, everyone struggles with different stuff, but you know, and they can open up about that. But I mean, <laughs> we've had a lot of colleagues that just gave up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I knew that I wanted the two of you on Melinda's show. And we're going to have to have you back we because are. this conversation is so important because so many of us, you know, we just believe what our doctor tells us or what they say on the news or what we read in a magazine. Marshall. And um, I'll tell you, uh, I've seen so many doctors diagnose me wrong uh, over and over again. Uh, I was told for three years, there was absolutely nothing wrong with my knee and I could hear it grinding constantly. And I finally found a doctor, I said, could you at least do an MRI because there's something really wrong. And the question was, how are you walking around like that? You have almost no knee left. It needs to be replaced. And for three years I complained and I was told, Karen, it happens with age. Well, you know what? Um, if that's the case, it happens with age, then let's, let's fix that a little bit. So- well well, we would love to be back. I would just say to what your, your point, um, you know, we have our thoughts, opinions, and obviously we're, we have our biases on how to fix things. There's no easy answer, but the, to your point, the biggest thing that I think all physicians and healthcare people would agree is that patients need to sadly, but need to advocate for yourselves and not always trust what the physician says and get another opinion. And having lived through that just even recently this last year with this arm of mine i had uh, it was the fourth orthopedist the fourth specialist that i saw um, that finally listened to me when i say this is what i'm feeling like everyone else seems to think i'm crazy and they want to do something else to your point and you know, I have a little bit more inside knowledge and it actually could work against me because I'm a doc and I wouldn't maybe imagine too many things and know too much. But when you know that you, I'm not being listened to and if someone says, oh, I think this is what you need and it doesn't sit right with you, even as a physician, I would um, my, you know, trust my gut and go, I just don't, this doesn't feel right. Get another opinion. Absolutely. Um, I never work with a doctor that I can't talk to. Right. If you're not willing to listen and to what I'm actually going through and you, you know, then why am I here? Right. Because I live in my body. So exactly. I know my body better than you do and you need to listen. And if you're not willing to listen, then I can find somebody who will do that. Right. And we can work exactly. on healthcare together, right? We can work on fixing it together. Before we go, because, oh, my gosh, we've gone an hour and 10 minutes. I can't believe yeah. it. But it is one of my favorite topics, I must say. And you guys have been amazing to be on and talking about the challenge of health care and medicine, because it is a challenge. And that's what this show is all about, getting through the challenges. But you Absolutely. have your own podcast. Is that correct? We do. Can you just yeah. quickly yeah. state your podcast? Absolutely. Yeah, we were just recording this morning. Our podcast is called... BS free MD. I think if Tim moves his head, um, you'll be able to see there it is <laughs> on that uh, our little poster there. But yeah, BS free MD. You can check out our website bsfreemd.com. We're on most the popular uh, podcast platforms. Spotify and Apple are the most popular, and we post on social media little antics and updates on uh, Instagram and Facebook. We put our video now up on Rumble. We're working on our YouTube channel. So that's our podcast. There you go. You're everywhere. We're Thank Trump. you so very much for being on. I hope the listeners will check out your podcast. We'd love to have you back. Right, Karen? There's Absolutely. so much more we could talk about. So hey, thank any, you. Anytime we would love to come back. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye-bye.